So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I will not take speaker time away, and we are starting on time. Uh, I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, Mark Jan Bastian. He is an experienced software engineer working in embedded systems, and he will tell us about concepts of hardware development and control in his talk, Radio Chips and Failure Modes, World Radio Spectrum Domination Through Silicon Control. Give a big applause to our next speaker, Mark Jan Bastian. Hello, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, we'll, um, yeah uh, we will give a quick outline about uh, several things which I've experienced the uh, last uh, well decade uh, on uh, embedded software development. Uh, we'll give a very quick overview about uh, uh, SPI signals. Maybe many people are uh, well known with uh, those interfaces. Has been used a lot on the, on the board itself. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the role of patents in semiconductor and IP licensing. Um, there actually, my name appears on a few patents, not related to radio, by the way. Um, uh, but well, there are, there are a few concepts uh, there that you have to uh, uh, understand while uh, uh, debugging uh, hardware. Um, I will give uh, one example, uh, because it's very simple and analog, uh, about the proprietary extension of the USB protocol. That's already very old. Uh, and after that, I will move into uh, radio-based, uh, uh, real radio chips, uh, RF protocols, and specifically direct sequence spread spectrum, one of the modulation ports which is used both in GPS and the variant of it as well in uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, and after that, I will look, uh, well, give a few remarks about things which you can do as an embedded developer to, uh, uh, well, ensure uh, success of your product. Uh, so, well, this is, uh, maybe people have uh, seen this, this is a screenshot from uh, a Salai uh, logic analyzer. Uh, you see here a very simple uh, system with uh, a rising uh, clock edge. Um, and on the bottom, you will see uh, the digital signal, and that that's encoded to C7 hexadecimal. It's uh, very simple. Uh, this is on one platform, and then on another hardware platform, if you try to output the same signal uh, with a specific mode of that chip, then all of a sudden you see this. And this is very interesting. Here we see five clock cycles uh, with the same uh, result. There's still C7. There's a lot of time without any clock cycles, and then all of a sudden you see three bits. This is very curious. How, how could that happen? Um, well, I, I was looking into this, and uh, well, how can you develop silicon which outputs these patterns uh, in a simple way? And what I have found is this, uh, transaction level modeling. Uh, you can make a model of all the transactions that are being passed over SPI bus. Uh, for example, on the SPI flash chip, uh, read, write, and erase, those are separate commands. After that, there comes an address and a few other parameters. Uh, you can determine which patterns and sequence are normal. And you can see which patterns need to, might need to, uh, to be transformed. Um, then you can modify the content of the transaction that happens actually inside this uh, uh, silent period. Uh, and then you can, uh, well, during that time, you have to hold back the clock uh, that outputs uh, this uh, SPI transactions. Um, and, well, you have to also optimize that logic. So we need a hardware pro uh, proxy. You have to make specific R RTL to actually, uh, well, reduce the number of gates that, you, uh, uh, that are being used. Uh, and then uh, you're having a, a successful hardware proxy. Well, what you can do with that, uh, you can, for example, uh, uh, enforce a protocol license or a proprietary extension uh, that needs to be part of a software uh, that runs on this chip uh, in order to uh, um, make it all work. Um, yeah, well, why would you do that? Uh, indeed, implement an extension of a, of a, or a variant of an existing protocol, uh, enforcing licensing terms or revenue over spe specific software that you need to put on that SOC uh, to actually make it work properly, uh, and also to maintain vendor control, so that's the chip vendor, uh, of a, a software updatable hardware platform. Well, software updatable hardware platforms are everywhere. I mean, everybody here on the camp uh, got their own one. It's a very nice one. It has a, both a USB interface and a Wi-Fi interface. And it would be nice if you can update your software, which you built or completely yourself, uh, both via USB and, and via Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, well, for patents, uh, we'll give you a small example. Well, USB serial bus is very well known. Billions of connectors. Uh, it's the best computer standard, uh, uh, well, I, I think, uh, of the whole computer industry, thanks to Apple and Microsoft uh, while pushing that uh, thing in the late 90s. Um, the tests of the USB protocol are very well specified. The USB IF, uh, 
Um, back in the days, early USB days, I think it was Brad Hosler who actually uh, specified that. Uh, so uh, electrical specification, the rise times uh, of cables, uh, controlled impedance traces, all that part was so very well specified and there were many tests available to really make sure uh, the, the USB was, became the most interoperable uh, standard. Uh, protocol test software is also freely available. There are many virtual machines and other ways to actually monitor on the uh, host controller level or actually operating system level. Uh, but there's also a lot of hardware analyzers. Uh, for example, there's Alisys in Switzerland who is making lots of USB analyzers uh, which can uh, decode almost all aspects of all the traffic over USB bus. Uh, without actually interfering with the timing of the USB itself. So that's very important, because if you're debugging two pieces of hardware talking together, uh, well, you also want to make sure uh, uh, there's no, uh, nothing interfering with the timing to make sure uh, you're not interfering with the process. Um, but nevertheless, there are proprietary extensions also to USB. Uh, this is an, uh, a proprietary extension that I found back in, uh, well, it was early, uh, well, late, uh, around 2009. Um, and uh, the, the patent itself came from, uh, was filed I think in 2005, there are several versions of the patent, uh, but well you can uh, look it up, it will be in the next sheet. Um, USB exists of two lines basically, or four lines, uh, one, uh, one pair is power, uh, 5 volt and uh, ground, and the other one is differential, D plus and D minus, that's, the other, uh, that's a, a nice 19 ohm differential pair. Um, there are a few points in the protocol where uh, the signal is not differential, but it becomes uh, uh, single-ended. And that's during the end of packet uh, symbol and uh, during a bus reset. Uh, and the bus reset is used for speed negotiation. Uh, so if you want to go for USB 1, uh, then it's 12 megabits or sometimes 4 megabits, if you, depending on which line you pull up as a device. Um, and on the, uh, for, uh, for higher speed, you need different line drivers which drive more current through the bus. Um, and there's a special protocol uh, that's being played during that, uh, 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 during that reset. Um, the, the threshold voltages for those uh, things are also very well specified, but you can as, uh, create additional threshold voltages, and that was made into a patent. Uh, this is a patent. I will not mention too many names in, in here, but there is a patent number here on the side, which you can look up and then you can uh, find all the names. Um, uh, but well, this is uh, 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 on the left, you see uh, uh, the scale. There's 3.3 volts, 1 volt, and then it's not completely linear in the bottom. So there's 130 millivolts and 100 millivolts. Uh, and the difference of that is actually being used uh, to signal. Um, uh, uh, or do a secret handshake between host controller and the, and the device, which is quite curious. Uh, but it also means that if you have, a, for example, different length of cable or a different thickness, uh, then you might have an influence uh, on the, the result of that speed negotiation or the uh, reliability of your device. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, uh, patent. Uh, and yeah, if you, if you see uh, intermittent issues with USB, well, you might actually think, well, maybe I should use a use shorter USB cable just to get uh, things working. Uh, well, and the host controller itself is also mentioned. Uh, well, this is a later version of the patent, and here you see well, the host controller itself uh, it says here, uh, you know, let's select a, a lower zero voltage threshold. So the op amp, which actually has to compare the voltages, uh, will ex uh, is actually uh, being influenced here. Well, now we, let's go to, go to radio chips, because, well, there's nothing more analog than, uh, than a radio signal. Uh, well, what, what is all in a radio chip that uh, well might not be in uh, 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 might not be completely uh, known to everybody? There are many things there. There's low noise amplifiers, uh, uh, soft filter. There's a surface acoustic wave. That's a very narrow band filter, uh, which is mainly, for example, used in GPS receivers. Uh, there are modulators, voltage controlled oscillators, uh, phase lock loops, and phase detectors. Um, well, that's sort of creating a beautiful, uh, a clean uh, uh, carrier wave for a local oscillator. Uh, there's analog device uh, or, or uh, um, analog to digital and DA converts, of course, uh, which are all you'll also find in sound cards, except in radios. Usually, uh, they have much more bandwidth. I mean, an audio card stops at uh, well 192 kilohertz, uh, and AD converts and DA converters, uh, which you can find in wideband uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, transceivers. Then can go go, uh, go up to 200 megasamples per second today. 
so those are significant bandwidths uh, which produce also a lot of data. I mean, you, uh, if you get a 14-bit uh, AD or a DA converter, those things can generate 800 megabytes per second, uh, which is a bit difficult to process in software. But you can do it in hardware much better because you have all the multipliers close by. Um, and well, that's uh, the console. Uh, there's also other analog things, uh, very old ones, as a bandcamp reference. That's uh, something to uh, get a stable voltage for uh, all the other analog parts. Uh, crystal drivers, uh, that's something which you'll use as a power control, because crystals cost time, uh, take, uh, takes power. Uh, uh, good clocks also to click, take uh, quite a bit of power, uh, and you, well, you want to have some, uh, some choice in that. Uh, so there's also re that's also the reason, the power consumption, to having a 32 kilohertz and uh, uh, well, a tens of megahertz uh, clock uh, in, your, in your chip. Uh, and those crystals are being turned on and off all the time just to conserve power. Uh, there's automatic gain control. Uh, that's uh, basically an analog amplifier or voltage gain amplifier. Uh, there are power amp control. That's for all uh, if you want to transmit also uh, with it. Uh, there, are, there are specific drivers which actually push in enough current in it. And there's well, lots of interfacing circuitry for uh, your analog sections. So while these are all things which are usually abstracted by, uh, uh, by, ma by many people that uh, de uh, develop device drivers, but it's all, all part of a chip, and there's a lot of IP on the, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, area. And then we have the digital section. Uh, well, that's, uh, well, typically it is, it's all done in the, in the CMOS process. Uh, there's preamble detection, the clock recovery, uh, demodulation and modulation. Well, uh, well those things uh, for data signaling can usually be done uh, all in uh, uh, digital hardware. Um, uh, well, preamble detection is usually kind of a correlator-like approach. So if you, uh, uh, well, if you use a correlation process, uh, that way you can e easily track, uh, well, what is the, uh, um, is, is this a packet from me or is it just noise, uh, which is uh, which you found on the radio. Uh, well, the clock generation and modulation, uh, well, sometimes you need to have a calculated clock offset. Uh, well, for that you also have to do some calculations. Um, well, the modulator and power amp control, uh, that's, uh, the, yeah, power amp control, digital pre-distortion envelope tracking, those are things very specific for transmission. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, these are, are also made to actually make the hardware as cheap as possible. Because, uh, well, a power amp in a mobile phone, uh, you only have, I think, a 4.2 vo uh, voltage of the, uh, uh, of the lithium-ion battery, and you want to put as much power of that into your antenna. Uh, and for that, you need to uh, have some, some local uh, optimizations uh, to actually push this amplifier into distortion. It's a bit like a guitar amplifier. If you uh, push it in into distortion, it sounds much nicer. But for uh, digital communications, that's not good, because if you get distortions, you get more harmonics, and your, signal is not, your, uh, your system is not linear anymore. So you have to uh, pre-distort it, and then well, you get a more linear output and that way you get a better output. Um, yeah, there's a few, uh, some audio codecs and encryption acceleration as well. Um, well, this is uh, then uh, a few things that you uh, also find in radio chips. I will skip a bit through this because well, all, uh, this is all about uh, removing DC components, uh, analog uh, transceivers. Uh, they are, uh, you cannot send a very long one string to them. Uh, they, will, they will need some one to zero transitions uh, to recover the clock and keep synchronized uh, with, uh, the, uh, have the receiver synchronized with the transmitter. Uh, same you also find the PCI Express, uh, which is uh, also a serial signal, uh, which has similar pro properties. Uh, oh yeah, and you also get a few K symbols. So if you program FPGAs, you also have Serdas interfaces, and there you have actually access to all the K symbols uh, which are inside those things. So that's always very nice to actually uh, look into uh, both the specification of the protocol and the specification of the FPGAs if you can uh, actually accommodate all uh, those uh, protocols. Um, yeah, then, the, then there's a lot of software in the radio baseband, uh, all about power management. I, uh, uh, so we want to spend as much time in low power modes, just turn off of clocks. Uh, turning of low noise amplifiers, those things are all uh, very quite power hungry. Um, uh, oh yeah, and you also want to reduce leakage current because well, modern chips having so much logic that the total amount of leakage current of those all this, this big uh, plane of CMOS logic is uh, getting uh, significant. So in that case, you also sometimes want to power off uh, parts of that as well. Um, yeah, well then the radio IP. Um, well, just like you saw on USB, in Radio IP there will also be uh, uh, proprietary extensions. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, those extensions do not provide a clear benefit. 
but sometimes you just must uh, license uh, additional uh, things just to get uh, that, uh, that part of the radio working. Uh, plant obsoles obsolescence is also an issue, of course, while well, many consumer electronics, uh, while well, having those kind of uh, things in there, uh, just having a little bit slower of older protocols, so it breaks a bit of compatibility. Um, and yeah, then I give you new licensing terms and software. Um, then I will give, provide a quick, uh, simple example from uh, for radios. Uh, well, GPS is, I think, the most compatible radio system ever invented, I think. It was uh, designed by the US Air Force, so it's a very nice system. Uh, it's an open specification, thanks to Ronald's uh, Reagan response to a Cold War incident. Uh, so yeah, that uh, was, uh, I think that's very, uh, very beneficial uh, for everyone and it became, became also an a big market for consumer applications. Uh, everyone with GPS can determine their own location, you don't have to reveal it to uh, others. You, you just have to, uh, well, measure all the clocks of all the ones. And it's also very power efficient. I mean, every power, uh, if, if you look at only at the L1 band, there's around 27 watts per satellite beaming to Earth. So in total of for 24 satellites, there's around 400 watts of power being beamed at the Earth. And with that amount of power, uh, you can, everybody on Earth can determine their own location. It's a very great, good, cool feature. Uh, the receive level on Earth on the, is then very low. I mean, most Wi-Fi receivers, uh, you're having a level of minus 100 dBm, which is basically the noise floor. Uh, on the GPS, it's minus 128 dBm. Uh, and the only way you can receive that signal is uh, by just generating the same signal and then correlating it with the noise you receive. And then you get a correlation peak, and that correlation peak you can track. Uh, that system is called uh, CDMA or DSSS. Uh, well, the term CDMA is a bit confusing in the US because CDMA is also a mobile phone standard there. Uh, but direct sequence spread spectrum is, I think, the best specification for such kind of modulation. Uh, well, GLONASS is a Russian system. Uh, well, you're having your own frequency, so uh, well, that's completely independent. And you see now also other nations uh, uh, making their own navigation system. For example, AU has a Galileo, uh, which is using exactly the same frequency. And that's also a nice property of, uh, uh, of uh, DSSS. You can put multiple signals in the same frequency and then still receive them all at the same time, just uh, by the power of correlation. You should not put too many in there, but well, if you have good uh, negotiations, then uh, that should all work. Um, yeah, then, well, the most uh, common uh, GPS band is the, the L1, that's uh, 1575.42 megahertz, it's around 5 megahertz wide. Uh, it must be very quiet, um, so yeah, you don't want to have uh, too many mobile phones transmitting uh, in the frequency, uh, in a few megahertz within that frequency. Uh, there are satellite phones which are a little bit below it, uh, but well, that's about it. Uh, and almost everybody will use only the L1 band. Um, so, uh, uh, and yeah, the other nice thing about CDMA and these systems, they are relatively resistant to CW interference. CW stands here for carry wave, so it's a strong sinusoidal signal. For example, uh, a sideband of a transmitter on the lower band, which can interfere with, uh, uh, with a GPS signal. Um, yeah, well, um, the, well the, to actually uh, make, the, make the correlation uh, work better, there's also CW filters in most uh, digital hardware. Uh, that uses DSS, uh, but its output um, uh, is usually not output to the end user. So uh, there are some tracking and filtering for it, but usually it's not output to the to the user. Uh, you, of course, you can uh, uh, use open source hardware, and there's a receiver from SwiftNav which actually uh, uses FPGA for the correlation and a Maximara front end for uh, digitization, and then you can actually program uh, that stuff yourself. Um, you also need a specific ADC, uh, well, it needs to be having a uh, one or two bit resolution with uh, well-defined levels. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, the decision between what is a one and a zero, it's more, much more well-defined on those low, uh, low resolution ADCs than on the higher precision ones. And you also need a very stable clock because, well, you have to generate exactly the same clock as uh, um, used uh, at uh, the GPS receiver uh, satellite. Uh, to actually generate the signal and do the correlation, and you have quite a long integration time. So during the correlation time, you have to make sure this clock stays uh, uh, aligned with the other clocks. Um, well, the way to actually uh, make a GNSS or a global navigation satellite systems like GPS, Galileo, Baidu, uh, uh, GLONASS, uh, well, you can uh, track and lock CW interference yourself. Uh, you can implement your own correlators and trackers. Uh, well, you can, for example, also track direct reflected signals from, uh, 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 because, well, modern receivers, they can tra trace the GPS signals down to 160 dBm, uh, minus 161 dBm. Uh, so there is quite a lot of uh, range also uh, 
uh, getting uh, well track a reflected signal. That's that's possible these days. Uh, you can also use SDRs with uh, more precise clocks. There's lots of open source software available. Uh, and nice thing is also you can calculate your own clock offset, and with that you can make your own time receiver. Uh, for example, there are special uh, uh, TC, uh, OCXOs, uh, which you can then control by a GPS signal, and that way you're having a globally synchronized clock that's used a lot with uh, radio astronomy applications, where you have what, two, p two stations on the Earth, one on one side, on the other side, looking at the same s stars, and then look, uh, they want to uh, uh, look sometimes look for weeks at the same uh, uh, part of the sky, and then uh, do res reception for that. For that, they also use GPS to synchronize their clocks. Um, uh, yeah, well, and there's also, uh, 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 well, the signals that I just mentioned, CW interference, they can come from a lower frequency, and which is, uh, uh, well, it has some sidebands in a higher frequency. Uh, but what is also possible uh, is that there are, uh, well, military applications that are actually jammers and spoofers, or, uh, well, those kind of things. Uh, well, you can also try to uh, pinpoint those using an antenna array. Uh, that's well. That's another nice application. I don't see, uh, haven't seen a complete application for that yet, but well, that's definitely something to uh, interesting to research. Um, then on the IP side, uh, that's a few uh, concluding remarks. Uh, always ask your supplier or supply chain uh, to exceed, uh, get full control of the RTL, so the register transfer level logic that goes into their chips, so that you know uh, how to test uh, whether you have a, a real chip or a clone chip. Um, ask which patents, revisions, and claims are applicable, so then you can actually verify if, uh, well, if there is something uh, going on there, or whether there's something that you might have forgotten. Um, well, you can also, of course, check your serial SPI and digital interface time. It's very easy. I mean, uh, Salai Logic Analyzer costs only, uh, well, a few hundred euros, and then, well, you're, uh, uh, then you're having a very good uh, uh, timing interface, uh, timing lock. Uh, what you can also do is ask a VRA locker VHDL model, uh, well, some vendors already do, are doing this, uh, and with that you can, uh, uh, well, you're getting, uh, again, well, you can, uh, you can actually verify whether your chip meets the specification. And so now I'm open uh, for questions. A big applause for Mark John, please. Well, thank you. So, are there any questions for him? Oh, okay. No <laughs> questions. Do you want to tell us something else? You can still um, use eight minutes of your time. Eight minutes. Oh, well, there's uh, plenty of time, yeah. Um, yeah, well, this is a small radio tube, which I found at the uh, Ham Radio Show in Friedrichshaven. I thought that was very nice, because, well, there's a very old radio tube, and it exceeds advertised for better reception, so I think it's uh, applicable for this talk. So uh, I'm not sure how many people using a, a tube-based uh, radio here, but uh, I wish everybody has the best reception for their radio signals uh, as possible, so. All right. This hasn't inspired <laughs> any questions from <laughs> <Okay>. the audience. <laughs> All right. No one wants to have a world control domination <laughs> of radio-enabled systems. Well, okay. that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, so thank you very much, well, Mark John. Yep. And again, a big applause for him. Thank you.